Hello, Goodland Church. Hope that you've had a great week. I'm excited to dive back in once again into the Gospel of Mark with you. But before we do that, I want to give a little bit of context for understanding the passage. So if you are familiar with scripture in the Old and New Testament, you know that it speaks a lot about the heart. And a couple of my favorite passages about the heart is that it talks about out of the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks, or the heart is the wellspring of life. And when we hear the word heart, we usually go uh, right to the emotional side of things. But in the ancient context, the heart would have been more than just our emotions. It would have been the seat of decision-making and our intellect. It would have been the place where we bring together our rational thinking as well as our emotions. So it was a lot more holistic in the sense that when we spoke of the heart, we meant not just how you feel about something, but how you think, how you feel, how it, um, your soul responds to something. It was much more of a sense of wholeness, of the root core, the center of you. And that's really important because the passage we're gonna look at today, Jesus is really speaking to the heart. And I know we've been journeying through the book of Mark asking the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And I think what we're gonna see from this passage today is that when we follow Jesus, what we do or how we live is connected to our heart or to put it in the opposite way our heart is in it that when we follow jesus it's not just a set of beliefs that we ascend to in our mind it's not just a set of rules that we act upon in our lives but it's our whole intellect our our emotions everything is putting in to trying to live out this life So hopefully that gives us a little context as we dive into the passage. Um, We're looking at chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, so I'm going to read that for us. Mark chapter 7, verses 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why do your disciples live according to the tradition, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied against you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are are but rules taught by men. And you've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is a gift voted to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father and mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, anyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of a man's hearts, men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, idolatry, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. All right. This is a longer passage than we've been diving into lately, but um, it's all cohesive. So it fits all together. So I want to make sure that we talk about it together. Okay, so one of the first things I want us to notice is that 
We've been seeing, most recently, Jesus performing miracles. We saw um, healing, exorcism, provision, calming the storms. We've seen all these things happen. And usually in Mark, Mark will juxtapose those incidences with a voice of the teachers and the Pharisees. And here we have another example of that. So Jesus is gaining popularity. Jesus is maybe close to his height of popularity. And um, here we have the teachers of the law and the Pharisees confronting him. It's, they're looking for a way to entrap him. They're looking for a way to disprove him or to discredit him. And we see this over and over again in Mark. So on this particular day, we have a scene with the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself walking through the marketplace. And it sounds like they were hungry because they didn't even bother to wash their hands before they just gobbled up the food that they purchased in the marketplace. Now, in the time of COVID, I know I'm reading this with extra sensitivity to cleanliness and washing and sanitation. And I don't think that that's that Jesus is saying by any stretch of the imagination that don't worry about washing your hands, that's not a big deal. Nor is he saying that uncleanliness is okay. In fact, Mark does an interesting thing in this passage because you notice that he puts quotes around the terms that are used here, unclean and clean. And it's easy to just skip right over that, but I want you to notice that Mark is giving us an interpretation of what's happening by those air quotes, right? He's saying the teachers of the law are declaring it unclean or clean, but that's not the way of Jesus. And so the Pharisees, they're spying Jesus, they're spying on his disciples, they're trying to catch him in a trap, and there it is, opportunity. They're in the market, they take the food, gobble it down, don't wash their hands, and then, aha, they strike. So we see in verse 5, so the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Unclean, again, is in those quotes. All right, so let's dive in. What is happening here? What's going on? So as you may already know, uh, the law was handed in the Old Testament to Moses and given through Moses to the people of God. It was meant um, to give the people of God, his chosen nation, a way of living that set them apart, that made them different from the world around them. Not so that they could pat themselves on the back, but that they would show the seriousness and holiness of the God that they worshiped. Because especially in the ancient Near East, the people worshiped various gods most of the time, and it would reflect in their practices. And so Jesus, or so God, Yahweh set, us, set aside these rules and said, this is how you should live. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor. Um, don't commit adultery. Don't murder. You've heard these, the Ten Commandments that were passed down um, from, Mo or to, from God to Moses. And Moses was supposed to be the one to give those to the people. So he did. And then there were some other laws that were given. Um, we see a lot of those laws about ceremonial cleanliness, and we see other things given through the, the Old Testament in particular. But what happened was that teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes, their job as they saw it and they were appointed was to take the law and understand the law, know the law, know the finite parts of the law so that they would not disobey the law so that they could be holy and righteous before God, but then also that they would help the people of God to live in such a way that would allow them into God's presence. And so their motivation for their study and their enacting of um, the law was so that the people could be set apart, set apart and holy. They could look different than the other nations. Well, best intentions got a little out of hand. And throughout history, what happened was that the Pharisees and the scribes created more laws out of the Ten Commandments, the ones given by God. They created more and more and more and more laws, and they became burdensome. And they weren't necessarily even laws. They were just traditions that were carried down as maybe interpretations or situational 
um, uh, obligations that became like a law. So it's a, something that um, was a suggestion or an interpretation and became law. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were enacting these principles and these laws and heaping them on the people that they might live in such a way. And one of those was this idea of ceremonially cleansing themselves. So in the Old Testament, the only people who held to the ceremonial cleanliness that is referred to here were the priests. And the priests were the ones who would have these ritual washings that would come before the Lord. And but at this point, where we see in the first century and Jesus on the scene, at this point, the scribes and the Pharisees were also practicing the ceremonial washings and they were imposing ceremonial washings on others. They were taking something that was a practice, a spiritual practice, and making it a spiritual obligation that the people had to uphold. Now, this is mostly oral tradition. It would not have been written down. These were just things that you would know and the scribes interpreted this for the people and this was their way of, of making sure, I, I'm assuming the best motive, making sure that they were a good representation to the world of the holiness of God. But what Jesus is calling into question is this idea that they were hypocritical. It says in uh, verse six, we see Jesus calling them out. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. All right, so Jesus is uh, quoting Isaiah 29 verse 13 here. And he's telling them that they are nothing but a hypocrite. Okay, so we have a lot of understandings of what hypocrisy is. So let me define hypocrisy for us so that we're all on the same page. The word hypocrite comes from the word actor, a person who put on different masks in a play. So they're inconsistent from scene to scene. So a hypocrite is someone who tries to wear different masks for different scenes. Whether um, that's somebody who says, I'm, I'm gonna follow Jesus, and they put on the follow Jesus mask in church, and then on Monday, they decide I'm gonna worship money, and everything I do is gonna be about a, a, my success and financial security, so they put on that other mask. but. On Sunday, they go back to the, I'm trusting Jesus and I'm following him and he's Lord. And Monday, they go to pursuing a financial gain. That's one example. The point is that they're inconsistent in the way, what they say in one sphere and how they act in another. It's not to say that somebody is hypocritical who, for instance, does not follow um, Jesus and they the rest of their life is looks like they're following themselves or worshiping themselves. That's, that's consistent, that's not hypocrisy. But it's the people who say one thing, live in one sphere with one mask, and then do another thing in another sphere. Another way of putting this um, is to say that it's making a show or acting, putting on an act of treasuring what God treasures and despising what God despises while secretly doing the opposite. I'll say that again. Hypocrisy is putting on an act of treasuring what God treasures and despising what God despises while secretly doing the opposite. So you say out of one side of your mouth, I despise sin and I despise what God is against. And then um, out of the other side of your mouth, you love the thing that you say you despise. It's really important for us to understand here um, that the Pharisees 
and the teachers of the law, they, they, I think they thought they were doing the right thing. I think they thought that these rules and the minutia of description, if they held people to them, that would create, um, it would help them to be close to God, help them to be holy. But they were safeguarding people from using and obeying the rules and interpreting the rules out of the overflow and the abundance of their heart and their mind. They were doing a disservice because instead of saying to them, you, you take this law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, that's the law. You shall have no other God before me, that's the law. Out of the overflow of the heart, thinking your rational intellect, live in such a way that you are in line with that reality. Instead, they gave little rules that they could follow to take the heart out of it. They were called out by Jesus, these scribes and the teachers of the law, because they were working on external observance and missing the internal and the heart connection. They were substituting their piety externally for a heart reality. And God says, you have taken these things, your heart is far from me. Another way of saying that is it's, their heart is a million miles away. It's very, very far. They were missing, missing the boat. So then we see verse, um, verse not eight. It says, you have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And then he goes on to tell them in a specific example. He says, okay, you know the, the law says, honor your father and mother. You got that. But you have taken another law, which is not law, which is a tradition, and you've elevated it and had it be competitive with the law that I've given. And that tradition is the one of, um, he's, it's verse 11. He says, whatever help you give, might give otherwise have received from me is Corbin. So here's what was happening. Corbin is a term used throughout the Old Testament. It's used 13 times alone, um, sorry, 80 times in Leviticus, Numbers, and Ezekiel, this term Corbin. So what does that mean? It's, it would be like an offering given to God or specifically an offering given to the temple. Um, so the loophole here was that the law said, honor your father and mother, but the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said, but if you, if you can't help your father and mother, you can't honor them by giving them your possessions and making sure they have a comfortable life, you can, if you don't want to do that, you, the alternate, uh, alternative option is for you to dedicate it to the temple or dedicate it to the Lord. You can say, Corbin, this is given to the Lord. The irony here um, is that the offering given it wasn't like it had to be handed over that second. Instead, it could be used until the death of the person who gave it. So you could say, Corbin, to my estate, and I get to enjoy that estate until I pass, and then at the point that I pass, then it would be given and maybe sold and the money given to the temple or something like that. It's kind of like estate giving nowadays. You know, somebody say, I'm gonna give my stock profile when I'm dead, I'll give that over to a charity. Because, But you still enjoy the fruit of the stock profile now. And so there was this loophole, the situation that's going, and Jesus is calling them out. He's calling a spade as a spade. He's saying, you say the law is honor your father and mother, but you have elevated a tradition of giving to the temple, notice that it may have benefited them since they were the executors of the temple. And he said, that is legalism at its finest. So what is legalism? So we talked about what is hypocrisy, now we're talking about what is legalism. Legalism is treasuring or despising 
the things God never mentions and believing there must um, that others must do the same. All right, so whereas before hypocrisy was making a show of honoring uh, God and um, being in line with the things he treasures and treasuring those things and being against the things that he despises. And then in another side of your life or another area or another community or in your, you know, in your heart, doing the opposite, your play acting, legalism is actually elevating something that was never meant to have the authority and the elevation and then imposing that same um, set of circumstances on somebody else. So a legalistic person takes things that are not at the heart of God's law, are not at the heart of God's intention, and it elevates it to be as if it were law. I mean, this is easy to do. The longer you're around the church, the easier it is to do this. And part of it is well-intentioned. I think like the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, very well-intentioned. But we put a lot of shoulds on people that were never shoulds. We do a lot of interpreting for other people about how they should live without allowing them to have the Holy Spirit drawing them to truth. Now, I want to say that it is not legalism to obey the word of God. It is not legalism to despise the things that God despises, to hate sin. It is not legalism to treasure the things that God treasures. Obedience, faithfulness, those things are, that's not legalism. That's just obedience. And at the heart of this passage, we see that God wants us to obey out of the overflow of our heart, not because we should, but you know what? Sometimes obeying God's law and what's best for us Turning away from the things God despises is ultimately for our benefit, and it's hard. It goes against our own internal desires. It goes against our own selfish needs. And so that's, friends, that's not legalism. That's obedience, and no one has ever said that obedience is easy. No one has ever said that being a Christian is easy. But I think we've made a lot of things law that were never meant to be law, rules that were never meant to be rules. Because isn't it true that the Christian life is often seen as being all about rules? What you can and can't do. I've had so many people in my life say, I don't wanna be a Christian because I don't want anybody to tell me what I can and can't do. But here's the thing. From the beginning, God said, this is how you should live. These are the laws. They were not meant to harm you. They were meant to give you flourishing life to give you abundance of life. The law of God is meant for our benefit. That God puts laws in our place because like a good parent, he knows what's best for us. It's not easy. Sometimes it's painful. But to obey God's law, to obey his word, leads to flourishing life. So, legalism is elevating that thing above what is actually God's desire. The, this, the law was obey your mother and father. But the scribes and Pharisees took something that wasn't law and made it equal to or as important as law. Now, in this case, it benefited them. But in other cases, like I think about, some of you might not know this, but there was a whole to-do um, it's less so the case, but there are still pockets of this in contemporary Christianity where people would say Christians don't dance. It's not okay for Christians to dance. They made it into a sort of law, a ritual law of sorts, because, you know, it leads to lust and it leads to um, sexual immorality and impurity. And it has this, you know, it's the door to open into those things. And so there were, I mean, Footloose, it's one of the example, great examples in the 80s of a movie that captured this common belief. I think it's less so the case now. Because here's the thing, Jesus is addressing this thing, not it's dancing, but he's saying it's not about the dancing. It's about the heart. It's not about the law. It's about the heart. Lust doesn't come from dancing. Lust comes from the heart. 
because the heart of the issue is that the heart has issues. The heart of the problem is that the heart is the problem. The other passages that we find in scripture, um, one of the most common is that the heart is deceitful above all things. That we can't always trust our heart. That's why God, I think, has given us these laws to live by so that we will experience the flourishing life he created us to experience. I think looking at this passage, oh, I'll finish, then we'll go on. So after this, Jesus called the crowd and said to him, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. This is verse 14 and 15. Nothing outside a man can make him, quote unquote, unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of him that makes him unclean. And then the disciples didn't get it. And so they asked him to explain it. And he said, don't you see that it's not about what you eat? It's not about washing your hands that creates the cleanliness that you are seeking. Because the issue, like I just said, is the heart. And then he goes on to list in verse 21 and 22, a list, an exhaustive list of evidence of our broken hearts, our sinful hearts. And he says, for from within, out of a man or woman's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Wow, what a list. I want you to notice you can't see this necessarily in the English, but the first grouping here we have evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, and deceit. These are actually in the plural. And there's a sense here of this habitual nature of committing these sins, that they are repeated acts that we do. And then we have deceit, um, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. And these are singular. And really, I think they're, the sense here is that they're vices. They're not just acts we commit, but vices that control us. And I don't know about you, but I started it on the list and I thought, okay, I'm doing pretty well. And then I got to uh, deceit <laughs> because I thought I was doing pretty well. And then pride because I thought I was doing pretty well. And then I realized foolishness, I'm a fool because I thought I was doing pretty well. And I think the point here is not to call attention to our individual acts and compare us with one another to figure out how well we're doing. I think the point here is that it's an all-encompassing, pervasive, matter-of-fact condition that every heart, because it's human, dwells in this condition. That there is evidence right here and in our own lives that our hearts deceive us that our sin is caused, our brokenness is caused, not by somebody else doing it to us, but from within us. The evil things come from within, and those are the things that defile a person, or as it says, make them unclean. Jesus is flipping this on its head. They were working really hard to check all the boxes to protect themselves and others against being unclean or being defiled or being influenced by sin and brokenness. And they were missing the point that Jesus is saying that comes from within. The problem of our sin, the problem of brokenness in the world is not that somebody else has done something. The problem is it's me and it's in you it's in every one of us. Our heart is fundamentally off balance. And so to address the issue, to address the sin, to address the brokenness and the waywardness, we can't address it through legalism and we can't address it through hypocrisy. In fact, those two things further emphasize the fact that it's an internal heart issue. But really, the only way to address it is 
to have our hearts transformed. And friends, this is the message of the gospel. This is the message of scripture, that our hard hearts are turned from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, that Jesus restores our hearts, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what the scripture says, that he takes our sin, our brokenness, not just our habitual, multifaceted, layered approach to sin that comes out of our heart, but our condition, and he cleanses us. He purifies us from within. That Jesus doesn't care about our activities so much as he cares about our heart. And not now, lest you think I'm saying he doesn't care what you do. He does care what you do. But he knows that we can't address what you do until you address the inner reason you do it. Yes, obedience is called for. We're going to see that. Jesus actually calls for his people to obey him. But he doesn't want them to obey him by following the letter of the law. He wants them to be obedient because of the transforming work that God does within their hearts, within your heart and within my heart. The good news of the gospel, as Tim Keller says, is we are far more sinful than we ever imagined. We're far more broken than we ever could have realized because we deceive ourselves in that. But he also says, and I agree, the good news of the gospel is that we are far more loved than we could ever imagine. Being loved by God does not give us license to live in disobedience. It actually propels us living out of the heart overflow, out of the heart abundance, to walk in step with God and his law for us. Following Jesus means that we recognize that we need his transforming work in order to obey him and live in fullness. So I wonder, as we're reflecting today, I'm going to ask two questions for your reflection. And I wonder, what have you made a law that isn't a law? What have you determined is a must or should for yourself or for others that was never meant to be a law. The second question is, what actions have you used to make yourself appear to be righteous? Have the appearance of walking with Jesus while at the same time you know that your heart is duplicitous. Your heart is not in it. You're an actor. You're a hypocrite. pathway forward to the transformation of God in our hearts is through the act of confession. When we confess our sins, John says, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had an opportunity. Jesus was showing them the brokenness of their hearts, the sinfulness of their hearts, and giving them an opportunity to live differently. You and I have that same opportunity. We don't have to live hypocritical lives. We don't have to live legalistic lives. We can actually be set free from those things to live out of the true healing of our hearts in obedience to Christ. So friends, whatever it is, confess your sin. God is good. He will forgive your sins and purify you, cleanse you, make you clean from the inside out. Because the heart of the matter, is it's the heart that matters. Amen.